Hey, everybody, welcome to week 213, 213. And by the way, I think we're going to be off next week. Yes, we are. <laughs> we're off 4th of July, Independence Day. Oh, and by the way, I got this book this uh, week from um, Amazon, and he's an author up in Davidson, Adam. Um, and it's about uh, who is your founding fathers. And um, a friend of mine, my roommate from college, who lives in Denver, Colorado, he goes, man, uh, are you familiar with the Mecklenburg Declaration? And I said, oh, yes, I am. And he's actually going to fly down here uh, the 20th of July, I think. And we're going to, so I got the book, but it's by this author in, um, let me see where where it is. Uh, oh, dang. Um, hold on. Got to get this for you because uh, he said, man, and, and my, my buddy, he's a three-time author. And he said, man, this thing is really well-written. So I'm like, okay, but he is in, in Davidson. Here is the book. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, here we go. It's called Who's Your Founding Father? And um, so I'm going to be reading into it, but it's uh, the true declaration of independence, which happened here in Charlotte. That's right. Mecklenburg Declaration. So that's going to be a ton of fun. If you've ever done, uh, or if you haven't, if you have never done the Segway tour, it's a historical tour on Segways uptown in Charlotte. Do it. I want to do it again. I'll probably take Alan to do that so anyway we'll be celebrating this um in spite of the fact that we're, we're gonna be like what the heck is going on with where's my money this irs thing is a mess and boy we've got the expert steven swanick on here so we'll get into that um in a little bit but i know adam and jack both have some stuff and again if you want if you got questions for Adam, hit us on the front end of this thing because he's blown out of here at 1130. But Stephen, uh, Jack, and myself will hold down the fort. So, Jack, you had something, though, first, right? Yeah. So, good morning, everyone. I had seen this um, bubbling up and then saw a – and this was a, a – found the, the original letter back in May, but it's bubbled up recently – and it's from it's a it's a cover letter from the Main Street Privacy Coalition, and it's dealing with um, this the American Privacy Rights Act as drafted in Congress. And what it does is, or what it proposed it pros, proposes to do, is to place an onerous burden upon business owners and liability upon business owners for breaches of data privacy that is really out of their control. So let me give you a little bit of the background. And so this, it's called the Main Street Privacy Coalition, but the Main Street is basically meaning, you know, ordinary people versus Wall Street. So there's that, you know, kind of nomenclature as between the two. So we're talking about, you know, in theory, the ordinary, um, you know, um, not invincible business person, business people like ourselves, right? So this coalition is comprised of 20 national trade associations that together represent more than a million American businesses. Um, the industries directly employ approximately 34 million Americans and constitute over one fifth of the U.S. economy by contributing 4.5 trillion with a T or 21.8 percent to the U.S. gross domestic product. Um, the concern is is that uh, this is going to enable uh, lawyers uh, and their clients to target these businesses um, in what is called privacy trolling. So they're looking for violations, uh, any violations, and then basically pursuing those violations to get potentially nuisance value or settlement value. Um, basically to a point where it, you pay some money and you're done with it, hopefully kind of thing. Um, you see similar practices in some cases in the the music industry by the, the association that um, is the police watchdog for uh, artists. 
And some, sometimes it's legit. I mean, you have bars and restaurants that are playing music and they, all they had to do was get a license, but the penalties for doing that are pretty significant and they add up. And so you have lawyers that have a specialty in doing that. Um, and so the specifically the concern is, is that uh, people within this, the, the people within this, what they call digital ecosystem should have rights to privacy. So you as a business owner receive this information or it passes through you, but are you ultimately responsible for the security if you're dealing with or utilizing a third-party service provider who has said, okay, we're going to set up your website, we're going to set up your portal for payments and credits and, and things like that. But what they're trying to do is hold these businesses that that have the relationship with the customer responsible. And so a little bit of kind of quoting from um, this letter, we recognize that consumer facing businesses um, that are represented in this organization are often with whom, with whom the consumers directly share their personal information, but these businesses do not monetize consumer data in opaque and deceitful ways and should not be held liable for potential data privacy violations committed by their service providers or other downstream service providers. So what they're asking for, they're saying, okay, we understand that 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 there needs to be this, you know, we as business owners should be not hiring fly-by-night companies that say they can set up our computer systems and everything else. So we do have a responsibility, but ultimately when we turn those things over to others that have the 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 professional expertise how is it fair to hold us responsible as business owners and that's the point which is okay yes regulation should exist but you've gone too far in the way it's been drafted so you have a very powerful group that is going and, and this is not the only group i mean there will be other groups for example in the franchise industry i'm sure the international franchise association is going to have some problems with that because imagine not only holding franchisees responsible, but holding the franchisor responsible because they said, use this service provider, which many yeah. franchisor systems do. They tell you, okay, they tell you, we suggest you use these people. Or sometimes they say, you have to use these people, but don't come to us if there's a problem. You have a contract with the service provider. So make sure you're in good, you know, you have your rights of <clears throat> remediation with that service provider. But you have to use them. And that's where kind of a lot of litigation comes up in, in that downstream. So this is just going to increase the amount of legal or le of um, litigation that occurs uh, in any form that is passed, but certainly in the form, if it were to pass as is now, it would put a lot of liability back on all of us. So something to think about, and, and really it's more of, and I wanted to bring this up as well, because it seems recently it's come up where, you know, it, not our problem, your problem kind of thing. Um, with the service providers. And so it is go figure things out with that service provider that you hired, um, even though we as the franchisor told you you had to use it. Or, um, you know, and, and this came up with a credit card vendor and who was responsible for literally putting in the wrong code for the business so that money, instead of going to an East Coast franchisees account it went to a west coast franchisees account and everybody's saying not our fault not our fault not our fault uh, so i did what you know when you when we get in that situation which is okay i hate to do this but i just throw everyone into the kitchen sink and like say someone's responsible you guys figure it out and let us know because we're going to hold all of you accountable and then you know you get the letters well this is what we did this is where our fingerprints are and only where our fingerprints are so surely we weren't the ones that actually, we weren't the ones who actually punched that number in remotely. So anyway, a little bit of a war story, but just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention and also ask you to take a look at your contracts where you have others providing services that deal with personal information, like credit card numbers and dates of birth and social security numbers and driver's licenses, lot numbers and stuff like that. Yeah, good. Well, while you were... Talking about that, Joseph sent us a note and said, hey, any of these new Supreme Court rulings have any play on us as businesses? Uh, so, so jo yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. Are, are you talking? Go ahead. I, the, I mean, the, the, when I saw a question, um, the two that the two that came to mind 
from my world uh, is that, you know, money that you make in foreign investments is still taxable in the U.S. So like the whole, you know, premise of, hey, can I put money overseas and not have it taxed here, which which used to be the case and then was um, shut down as part of that. That was, one, that was another, that was a revenue raiser um, in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that happened under Trump, um, that there was a positive revenue raiser uh, relative to a tax cut, which was basically, you know, you get taxed on uh, a component of foreign holdings. Uh, so that, I mean, it, it's funny, you know, you think about like, what was the cost of that? Because the, the, the matter was like $14,000, you know, that this couple was like, you shall not tax me, sir. <laughs> you know, it was like an investment that they had in India. Um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost, you know. Uh, so that that's one. I mean, it just says, hey, you know, you know, the, while there are still some perfectly acceptable um, tax planning strategies that do involve um, international uh, locations, um, just parking money over there, parking money over in investments over there forever is not one of them. Uh, so that that was one of them. Uh, the other one was more of an estate tax matter, but it actually impacts a lot of businesses because. You know, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they hear, hey, I have to have, you know, buy sell agreement that specifies, you know, what's going to happen, uh, you know, if I die, you know, geez, that needs to be insured. You know, Jack and I would both tell people, yes, you should get life insurance to cover um, your buyout. And a lot of people say, okay, cool. And then they go do it, you know, and then, then they never really pay attention to like, who owns the policy, how's it paid out, you know, all that, all that good stuff. So in this particular instance, I believe the facts are, and um, Jack, if I, if I get this wrong, you got a couple minutes to Google it. Um, <laughs> you know, effectively, you know, it's a, it's a company, you know, it's a company life insurance policy, which technically, if you didn't take a deduction for life insurance proceeds, the proceeds are not um, considered taxable um, typically. So it's not taxable income and you know not factored into your specific estate. So Gary's, you know, two million dollar life insurance proceeds, he kicks it, Jennifer gets the money, you know, Jeff, Gary, you gotta go looking out your back right now just to make sure Jennifer's not, oh wait, there's somebody behind you. Just kidding. She's not listening and she's not in the house right now. Yeah, so it's good. Okay, yeah, perfect. So you're you're safe for a few more minutes. Um you know, the, 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 the payday is not taxable um, and the, the proceeds are not includable in calculating Gary's estate exemption. What the Supreme Court held in this, in this particular instance is that while the value, like the payout was not considered taxable income, now the company had, you know, whatever it was, a couple million bucks sitting in it in cash from the, from the payout proceeds. When they were going to go to value the business, they included that cash in the valuation that then created a, an estate tax problem. So, like, the strategy to minimize the problem actually um, helped the problem a little, but then had an additive effect uh, to the problem um, because the money, you know, sat, was sitting in the company at the time of the valuation you know, versus like being paid out directly to Gary for the redemption or whatever. So it's not sitting in cash at the time of valuation. So it just, the lesson learned there is, you know, hey, I, I really need to make sure that my crap's in the right spot, <laughs> you know, from a from an insurance policy perspective. Because um, it is one of those things where it is a little bit complicated, but you only have to do it once. And it's important that you get it, you get it done right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, hopefully that helps. Also, I did put in the chat uh, the link to the book, Who's Your Founding Father, for anybody in Charlotte that's interested. Um, I'm going to dive into it next week because we're off to celebrate Independence Day. Uh, so that'll be a good time to read. So well, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Stephen Swanick, the founder and CEO of ERC Today, 
and a little preamble first. The reason that we selected Stephen Swanick and ERC today when the whole ERC was rolling down the, the pike is we had a feeling <laughs> that the IRS was going to be launching some heat-seeking missiles for all these pop-up shops that were promising the world, not based on any fact, some fast money where they get their commission and then all of a sudden they vamoose, they're gone um, and they disappear. Well, that has happened. <laughs> so we wanted to go with, we didn't want to do that ourselves. Uh, we had kind of burned our own people out on all the PPP money and all the calculations going to that. So we wanted a very conservative, trusted and proven source to go to that could help us and with our clients. And Stephen Swanick, we had history with them. So I didn't know that, but I teed up Stephen and his team to Adam and Adam's like, oh, <laughs> we know you. He was a client of ours. <laughs> so he's like, I'm really good with that. So without any further ado, Stephen, where's our money? <laughs> you know, yeah. what's going on? Yeah, and side note about that, Steve, if you haven't, since you're on your iPhone, you haven't seen the attendee list, your uh, former employer is actually on, so. No kidding. Yeah, say, say hello, apologize for anything that you did on the way out the door. <laughs> <laughs> I deny all of that, but yeah. <laughs> it's good, good the small world uh, is still getting smaller, so yeah. very happy to be here. And to yeah, answer so your question, go oh, ahead, Gary. Yeah, what I was going to say is, you know, give us a little primer on, okay, we got a lot of backlog from the IRS. They've said, hey, we're um, taking this through a fine tooth comb. So let's address that. And then let's go back a little bit more of like, all right, how did we get here? And we're, what's the path moving forward, do you think? Yeah, uh, very, very good start idea, Gary, to do that history lesson, right? So how did we get here? Um, we all remember the pandemic. We all remember uh, the government just bringing in money, helicoptering in money was the phrase to try to keep the economy going. They had their PPP program. Uh, they brought the ERC along at the same time, but nobody used it because it was this big, nasty, complex thing versus, hey, here, I get a loan from my bank for a PPP and I'll have cash by the end of the week. That's the way everybody went. So even after the pandemic was winding down, they were still looking for ways to keep it going or keep the stimulus going. They they made some textual changes that I believe it was the end of 2021 to allow uh, you to claim the ERC retroactively. And then suddenly, and you no longer had to pick between the two, you could do both, right? So then you see the floodgates open, uh, both legitimate and illegitimate players see that this is just a, basically a multi-billion dollar blank check from the government. The money starts flowing. The IRS receives literally millions of claims. Again, some legitimate, some illegitimate. Uh, in the summer of 22 and into early 23, they had special processing units that were just clearing you know, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of cash each week going out to the uh, the claimants, they start to get nervous. They see uh, one of my, I remember uh, I was really upset when I saw, I think it was a Super Bowl ad and it had the guy from uh, Modern Family, Ty Pennington. And he was uh, selling, um, I think it was ERC specialists or in, you know, innovation refunds. They were another one. And I was like, oh my God, a Super Bowl commercial, we're in trouble. Yeah. The IRS sees this and they know that it's it's not good. They've created a monster. They opened Pandora's box. So in September of 23, they dropped the M bomb on us, the moratorium, and we are now in the tenth month of that moratorium. So what what happened was they they drew a hard line in the sand as the September 14th, and they said anything before that we're going to put in one pile, and anything after that we're going to put into a different pile. And since then, they say they processed a small fraction of claims. I remain skeptical. But what all they've done since September is a massive scanning and research project. They wanted to put AI on these things, right? So that you know they would they'd have some data. And instead of just running the check, 
printing the check, they would look at that claim in context. And what I mean is, did this company even exist? Is this in an industry of high risk? Uh, did they file returns? Did they claim 100% of their wages, which is almost impossible? Uh, is that Did a number of claims all get routed to the same mailing address? These massive red flags for fraud. That's what they've been doing since September. And mm -hmm. uh, the reason I think I'm here today is because of the notice that came out last week where for the first time in months, they've shared some updates. So I'm happy to continue on that, Gary, or if you want to yeah. pause and ask any questions about anything I, I dug into with that kind of opening salvo. Yeah, keep tracking with their non-update update. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, the IRS, uh, Commissioner Werfel is the name. He's been on the job for less than a year. He has been extremely negative about this program. In his mind, and I, I guess maybe they had some evidence to back it up. I'm not sure. They think 90% of the ERC claims have been fraudulent. Um, that's terrifying as an no. American taxpayer. But uh, the good news is there are red flags in ways that they probably should have screened these out. I mean, when somebody's got a 941 with that they never filed, and then suddenly they file an amended return with the balance due, the IRS never should have paid those. There were so many things that they did foolishly that now they're backtracking. But anyway, Commissioner Werfel says that 90% of these claims are fraudulent. So they have uh, implemented all those uh, uh, ways of scanning and uh, analyzing, and they're going to start uh, over. They said at the end, over the summer, the end of the summer, I've heard both, they're going to start sending out massive disallowance letters. So anything that trips these, these red flags, they're going to start denying. Uh, then they're also going to simultaneously, they say, start approving claims again that don't meet, meet the risk red flag criteria that they've got about it. Uh, they call it their low risk pool. They're going to start uh, sending those out again, but only for those received before the moratorium. So we've got clients that have had stuff on file for over two years now. It's, it's frankly ridiculous. Um, we've tried all sorts of uh, taxpayer advocate services. We've got a few that are, uh, clients that are filing refund lawsuits because according to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, the IRS is required to act on a refund within six months. If it's been sitting there for two years, they obviously have failed that uh, even modest goal. Um, but uh, they're going to start, they claim the, the oldest first. So hopefully some of these people that have had theirs on file for up to two years. And if they work with us, we're extremely confident you're not going to hit any of those red flag criteria. They'll hopefully start printing that money again. Uh, July, August would still technically be over the summer. So at least they finally gave us some answers. They have a plan and they're now giving us a firm time of over the summer to start the denials and payments again. So <clears throat> that's really helpful, Stephen. Thank you. And it's really good to have somebody like you that one we trust, you know, because <laughs> like, um, and even though, <clears throat> and you also validated that no BGW CPA does not qualify. <laughs> and so we never applied, but we had all kinds of pop up shops repeatedly, even until, you know, the last few months. Hey, you qualify. No, we don't. <laughs> so, uh, you know, fortunately, but let's talk about those. Uh, and let's talk about retribution, where if we got a kind of a hostile IRS guy, that's like, hey, this was a stupid thing. And 90% is fraud. I have a tough time believing that, um, that that number, I think that's way out of whack. But Agreed. we know that there were malfeasance you know you know mal malfeasant people that were scamming the system going and buying ferraris and lamborghinis and whatever um for those that took erc money that are listening and that may have gotten it that may be nervous and like oh man what's this mean for us you know are these guys coming in with guns drawn and we think we were legit you know what do you think is going to happen with their enforcement arm well there's there's good news on that front uh first good news is if you work with us you should be extremely confident uh we were one of the few shops that actually told people no if you uh, went through our el eligibility analysis and we didn't see that you would get a claim we told you no 
And unfortunately, there's probably plenty of people that were shopping these and they would come to us and be like, oh, well, Innovation Refunds promised me $150,000. Can't you guys do better? Like, I, I, I promise you zero dollars. And if you get audited, you're going to pay it back. <laughs> but so that, that's the first bit of good news. The second bit of good news is more a matter of practicality. Um, we're outside the statute of limitations uh, on auditing the 2020 program. And we're coming up on the statute of limitations for the 2021 program. And unless Congress takes action, they literally can't do anything. Um, they Congress uh, passed a bill. Uh, well, no, the House, I believe, had a, a, a bill in February that was going to end the ERC claim early and extend uh, the statute of limitations. And it was dead on arrival in the Senate. And in an election year, you know they're not going to work together on anything. And I'm not going to play yeah. politics, but we're pretty 50-50 split. Both the House and Senate are in play. The presidency is a coin toss. No matter which side wins, it's unlikely to be a landslide, which means there's unlikely to be that filibuster-proof majority to get anything rammed through. So in my opinion, the statute of limitations is what it is. So you're going to have uh, a lot of those that are just untouchable by law. And then you got to figure, all right, say you're extremely unlucky. Uh, what about getting audited before that statute of limitations expires? The IRS does not have the staff to audit more than an infinitesimal fraction of these things. Uh, they'll probably go after, if they're smart, they'll go after Best Buy, which took a $170 million ERC on their SEC filed uh, reports. Wow. They'll go after those guys. They're not going to go after the mom and pop muffler shop that took a $32,000 ERC. They'll be smart to go after the ones that, again, I said, had some red flags. You took the ERC on 100% of your wages. Well, that's almost mathematically impossible to happen. They're going to go after those guys. And then, all right, say so you thread all those, those needles and you, a BGW client, gets audited. Well, what do I do? Well, thankfully, ERC today has what we call our, our audit package. It is a full itemization to the penny, to the period of every dollar claimed related to your 941s with an eligibility opinion citing the IRS. Well, here's what you, the example you gave us. Here's why this meets that criteria. Hand this to the IRS commissioner and tell them to go away. Go go after somebody that didn't deserve this. So. That's that's the retribution in a nutshell. If you work with BGW, you're going to be just fine. I could not pay you enough to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't pay you anything. But uh, hopefully y'all understand now why we chose Steven Swanick and ERC <laughs> today. Because um, we are here to help you save money, make money, stay out of trouble. And have fun while you're doing it. So uh, this is a big stay out of trouble move <laughs> with, yeah, with it, you guys. So it, go it, ahead, Adam. Kind of to put in context um, for the audience, Stephen, you know, you had the moratorium on September 14, 2023. I think you said, I mean, you're, you're in tune with, um, you know, your clients that have received refunds. Can you kind of give us a sense of like what the refunds were like before September 14th versus what you processed after September 14th? So in terms of our volume, we're down 95%. The, the moratorium and the end of marketing um, has really stopped traffic to us. And as a society, that's probably a good thing. Um, we got the benefit of the Ty Pennington's and all the other com competitors getting the name out there and then they would google the employee retention credit thankfully we we were high on google so we were getting kind of the cross-pollination of that but now that the moratorium's in place and money's not flowing 95 percent of our claims are are, are gone um, we are still submitting claims because the 2021 period is technically open but the IRS has shown hostility towards this program, and we are prefacing any claims. We're not taking deposits anymore. We're not taking any money. It's 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 a coin flip. It's 50-50 whether you're ever going to see any of this money because they want to kill it. And in their opinion, it's so late. You know, Here we are in mid-2024. The pandemic was four years ago. Their opinion is if you really needed this, you should have done it four years ago. And so we're, we, we want to say no. 
which stinks because if you didn't know about it four years ago and you are eligible, you should still get the credit. But I guess that's a subjective matter. Um, in terms of payments flowing since September, we've had this many new claims processed. We do have a claim. There are there is kind of an in between where the IRS approved a claim prior to September and whether it was lost in the mail, uh, uh, stolen. Um, there were some times where they 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 were kind of hung up. You'd see a negative balance on what's called your IRS transcript, your basically your bank statement of the IRS, um, and a, a negative balance, which means they approved it, but they just didn't hit the print check button. Um, we have seen those. Uh, we've been using Form 3911, which is check reissues, and Form 911, which is to get the taxpayer advocate service to just a second set of eyes to say, hey, this is approved. Why don't they have the money? We've probably got 40 or 50 of those total over the past 10 months. Um, so we are we are still checking weekly. Uh, we've got on a rotation about every about a third of our overall pipeline every week. We just turn that to check the transcripts, check for updates. We do see when they've been mailed in, they've been accepted, and they're just sitting there waiting for the IRS uh, queue to work through them. Um, we are hoping that in, uh, you know, again, they say late summer, our low-risk clients will start seeing new approvals and new disbursements. Now I got to take off, Gary. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks. Have fun and tell uh, the, the gang in Myrtle Beach, hey, for us. Um, <clears throat> so, Stephen... You know, early on when we talked um, about as you guys had had ramped up and and geared up for this program, we we all knew, hey, this is going to have a short shelf life, and then what? Because a lot of pop up shops like Poop, that moose, you can't find them, and you can't find any of the people. They aren't on LinkedIn. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but you guys have you saw that yeah this is going to be a short period of time and you started building another thing and you've got you've built a a, a pretty cool mousetrap for anybody talking peo we've had uh jeff warner on here multiple times with pair peo and um we're a big fan uh of pair peo because they've actually helped us as well we we recently moved to peo so we've talked about it multiple times on this program and the benefits and it's it's not necessarily for everybody but you guys have found kind of a niche for a PEO type product give this audience a little bit of an overview of first of all what it is, what is a PEO for anybody that's missed some of those other episodes but then also what you guys found was a need in the marketplace and what you're doing to address it. Cause I think you actually are kind of working in concert with Jeff and his team because they don't cover this particular uh, niche. Yeah. So uh, I'm a huge fan of PEOs as well. Um, uh, professional employer organization. It's basically uh, employee leasing in reverse. So instead of you going to a staffing agency and saying, hey, send me out some temp workers. It's more of, hey, I've got this person that I want to employ. I've already found them, but I don't want to do all the administrative paperwork. Uh, small businesses, you see it all the time. When a one-man shop or a one-woman shop grows and they have to hire somebody, they don't know what to do necessarily. And uh, the PEO structure allows that business owner to not have to become an expert in payroll taxes, payroll processing, human resources, benefits. They literally take that employee, put it on the PEO. So it becomes the PEO's uh, employee for processing payroll and benefits. But it's a legal uh, arrangement called co-employment. And you almost, you you put the employee on the PEO and then you rent them back from the PEO. Uh, it is it's still legally your employee through this co-employment relationship. You're responsible for the management and the duties but you don't have to deal with the payroll and HR side. Um, we found PEOs can be a great fit for uh, larger companies that want the buying power of uh, better benefits plans. Uh, if they simply just don't want to uh, grow their administrative team, but a lot of PEOs are uh, they're pricey. You you pay a lot for all these benefits you get, 
And small business owners don't necessarily want or need all those bells and whistles. So we identified an opportunity of, uh, we call it simple PEO, um, it really targets micro businesses. And the idea being when you are that one woman shop, the, that one man that's hiring your first employee, you can have access to you know, payroll benefits of retirement products without having to go get your own plan. You you might not be able to get your own plan if you've got such a small employee base, but you can offer a, a better opportunity to your very first employee and using technology, the idea being we can make it simpler, quicker, and therefore not have to charge as much. So um, that's the idea in a nutshell is to take that, that PEO model that currently applies to, you know, 10 and up. Most PEOs won't take fewer than 10 employees. And we're going after the opposite market, that one to nine employee size, you don't get as much, but you certainly don't pay as much and you don't have to become an expert in this you know, complex world that <laughs> you and I don't mind playing in Gary, but a lot of people just hate this stuff. I can't imagine why. Right, right. No, I think, it, I think it's really good. And I just wanted some, uh, you know, everybody that's on here to know about it <clears throat> because one, you guys, uh, you know, are, you're extremely intentional and thoughtful when you build out a product or service, you know, and, and ERC today is one of that. And this is not supposed to be an advertorial for Steven Swanick and, and all his genius, but <laughs> you have <Thank> served you. <laughs> our clients quite well. And, and, and we are, Jacket is in the same ilk. Our whole purpose is to help privately held businesses thrive. We love that, you know, healthy businesses usually means that, Hey, and if they're trying to do it right, it, it helps, you know, promote healthy families and healthy communities like Charlotte, North Carolina, where we love, you know? So, um, and I also noticed because we have their note taker, Gerald Broussard, who is a good friend of mine. And we were partners in a private equity firm. He was one of the founders and one of the early guys of Insperity which was at the time Administaff and uh, it was branded Administaff. And so he could go deep and long on, on that. He's a pioneer in that world too, down in Kingwood, Texas. So Woo. it's good to have you on here, Gerald, uh, as always, I appreciate your friendship tremendously. Um, but anyway, if anybody has any questions, um, oh, we got a question here. Awesome. Kurt. Clarification for Stephen. Did you say that the PEO becomes the employer of these employees while the small business is only responsible for the management of these employees? Yeah, you might want to give some clarity on that. Yeah, so the, the way the money moves is the employee would be, an, uh, they would get their W-2 from Simple PEO or Insperity or whoever is your PEO partner. They are the ones that on paper have uh, they they file the, the W-2s, do the direct deposits. They have uh, a lot of times their own benefits plan in their name. Um, and they've got group buying power because they've got hundreds, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of employees under that one PEO EIN. And if you pay that person $1,000 a week, well, they'll get their $1,000 a week paycheck from the PEO. And then you'll pay the PEO a flat fee of you know, 1200, 1250, 1300, whatever that the markup is on that. But you don't have to have a pay, payroll software anymore. You don't have a relationship with the benefits broker to get your own insurance coverage. You're not managing a 401k, an HSA, uh, dental plans, uh, ancillary benefit plans. You don't do any of it. It's off the shelf, ready from the PEO, um, almost like you're shopping. I want this, I want this, I want this, and offer that to my new employee. And you, they're your employee on a legal basis. So if they trip and fall at your uh, office, you're the one who's uh, responsible for that. But it would be a lot of times a workers' comp claim on the PEO. So um, co-employment, it's a it's a interesting legal topic. But essentially, all the finances are under the PEO, and all the management, hiring, firing is under you. Yeah, I, I like the the risk mitigation aspect of it as well. And one of the big reasons we we waited for a couple of years and Jeff Warner was quite patient with us 
he would never like he gets paid by whichever PEO and payroll provider, et cetera. Like that's how he gets paid. Um, but and there were a couple of times where he said, hey, it doesn't make sense yet. You know, the, the financial benefit just isn't quite there yet. Um, but kind of offloading that legal responsibility and, um, you know, vulnerability that a, a company has, that was one thing for us. The second thing for us was we've got a really good HR person that just w didn't want to get bogged down in a lot of that detail because you have to almost be an expert in that. And then there's a lot of liability risk that goes with it. She just didn't want that. And then what we found was you have this huge buying pool that even a 90 person firm like us, we can't compete uh, in the marketplace with, you know, millions of people in the pool, which so that drives down your cost, which is an offset against all these administrative things. But for us, it was about, I'm wanting to say, I may have this wrong, but I'm wanting to say it was about $100,000 a year of benefit that came to us, but most of it went to our employees. Most of it went to our employees. So to us, it may have been, as a company, it may have been like, I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 of the hundred. And, and these numbers are probably not completely there, but we wanted to bring good value to our, our employees to drive down those costs. Cause those costs, you know, like a year ago, we got hit, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and so it's just an interesting thing and it's worth looking up. Um, so yeah, Kurt, you're welcome. Thanks for a good question on that too. Um, so Jack, from your perspective, especially with the, the, you know, your expertise in mergers and acquisitions, as well as in the franchise world, what are you seeing? First of all, I, I do have a question before I ask this question. The first question is, what I heard, Stephen, was um, ERC money. If you were part of a PEO and a big PEO, let, let's say you're part of Insperity, which is one of the, probably the biggest one, probably the most expensive Cadillac. You know, it's a, it's a very good uh, PEO, not for everybody, but it's very good. If you're submitting ERC money or you know your ERC claim but you're part of a PEO, what I heard, and this is where I want you to, you know, you know, uh, you know, confirm or deny it. What I heard was, well, if you're part of the PEO, you're waiting for that provider to submit for the entire pool. Is that accurate? That is correct. And that is why we have struggled to work with PEO clients and it uh, about a year ago, we decided we, we literally couldn't do it anymore because the claim follows the 941, which is your quarterly payroll tax filing. Uh, it's the form to claim the ERC is the 941X, and it's just one line on a form that can be used for 100 different types of corrections. They just added a line that said amount of ERC. And because of that conduit, what that also meant is if you're in a PEO, they file a single 941 for their entire client base. So that 941, and if you've got 100 uh, clients that have 100 employees, instead of 100 ERC claims, you've got one ERC claim with wow. 10,000 employees on it. So these PEO size uh, ERC claims were in the millions, probably hundreds of millions for the ones of Insperity. So the IRS sees that. They see, again, uh, Todd's muffler shop with his thirty-two thousand dollar claim, and then Insperity with their eight hundred and forty million dollar claim. Like we're gonna put that one to the side, and we'll get back to it. <laughs> and a lot of those have have sat because of the magnitude. But then you, what you also see is the good PEOs were willing to do this, and they hopefully the best ones didn't pass on a lot of fees. We saw some pretty snaky ones um, that were using this as a profit center, and they would take our work. Uh, add it on the form and then bill their customer $1,500 a quarter. Again, just, just, just nickel and diming these people to death. But wow. what, what they would do is they would batch their claims, whether they were doing it the right way or the wrong way. They're like, we're opening the window. We're only going to amend 
2021 Q2 once, and you have six months to get us that information. And if you miss that deadline, we're not doing it again. So even if the ERC was still available for that quarter, these PEOs, they control the form. We can't file it for them, which is why we had to stop working with PEOs because we lost the control to be able to serve our clients. These PEOs would have a self-imposed deadline for their clients. We're going to file this once. And if you miss it, you're SOL. Um, what also stinks about the PEO model is we there's no w way for us to check if they've been paid. So we've We've heard rumors, we don't, it's tough to prove any of this, but we've heard rumors that some of these PEOs have been paid and they're sitting on the money. They're the ones keeping the interest. In some cases, there were probably some really fraudulent PEOs that filed on behalf of their clients. There's no feedback mechanism for the client to know that had been done on their behalf. And these wow. PEOs are pocketing the money. Um, we had to sever a relationship with the PEO who literally... They, after our third or fourth conversation, like, so we want you to file this on all of our clients. I'm like, well, we can't do that. We have to talk to them. It's like, no, 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 just, just do it. Just prepare the numbers for it. And it became clear that they were just trying to put money so in their own pockets. So it, um, it's, it's, it's tough. It makes sense why the IRS has put them off to the side. They have paid some, but we're just not sure what the answer is because the passage of time isn't going to suddenly make these answers more evident to them. They would have to come up with a new methodology of breaking it down per client. And then do they go to those those clients and ask for their substantiation? There's no easy way to answer those. So the PEOs are very tough, very risky, and there's a reason why they sit longer than most. Wow, that's that's a counterbalance <laughs> then to the the argument and the benefit of a PEO, at least to this kind of a program. So that makes sense but yeah i'd heard that and i thought oh i gotta ask you that question so now i'm going to go back to my original question to jack and that is from your perspective and your vantage point with your franchisors and franchisees um any any thoughts on what they've done whether it be on peos or even on the erc that has some additional color to this conversation. So a couple of things that the, you don't see a lot of these in the franchise ecosystem simply because the franchisor doesn't want to do anything that makes any type of or smells like joint liability with respect to franchisees and their employees. So you see this more in, you know, non-franchise situations. So my, my um, comment on uh, that kind of the cons is, yeah, um, everything he said, I mean, it is definitely, uh, you know, the things that I hear that, okay, here are the potential negatives. So for example, um, one thing is, and I haven't seen this blow up a deal, uh, because there's been workarounds, but who owns the data, you know, with respect mm. to, um, loss runs and things like that. And so you have a buyer, uh, a purchaser who's looking either to purchase the company or purchase the assets and then take on employees and continue the business on moving forward. Um, but usually it, there, there, you have a mechanism as to, okay, you know, do you have a confidentiality agreement? If it's, you know, is it um, a business associate uh, uh, agreement? So there are mechanisms to be able to safeguard that information, to have an orderly transition of that information. But, you know, you have to work for it. It isn't automatic. Uh, and because of the, the issue of ownership of the property, um, then there is the, okay, what happens when someone makes a mistake who's ultimately responsible for those things? And so you have those kind of things. But, you know, again, like most contracts, including a transition contract, whether it's an asset purchase or equity purchase and sale, that you're assigning those liabilities to one side or the other. And so um, either the, the, the buyer's taking on certain liabilities and um, so I, I think the biggest challenge has been in the, in the scenarios where there's been a PEO involved is getting the buyers to understand if they don't already understand how this works and if they wanted yeah. to continue it onward or are they going to basically um, retract that responsibility back onto themselves and, and go a more traditional route kind of thing. So um, it's it's similar to 
there's a lot of uh, organizations out there that are, are shared services type organizations that will provide the back office type of stuff. An example here in Charlotte, and here's a little story, um, back in uh, a few decades ago, when um, many people were asking Mr. McCall for money, nonprofits were asking him for money. Um, and I may be embellishing this a little bit, but I, 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 I like my version of the story better. So um, <laughs> what I was told was, is that he basically said, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of you guys asking me for money all the time. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you some land. You're going to build a building. You're going to put all these nonprofits together and you're going to create a shared services model so that you are more efficient with your expenses on the back office. So accounting, HR, everything else legal. And so there is a building on, um, I think it's on 5th or 6th in Davidson. And it is where um, several nonprofits are. And then there's a shared services model. And I was um, part of the the pain of going through and creating the shared services model when I was on the board of United Family Services, um, which is now called Safe Alliance. It's the battered, battered women's shelter. Yeah. And so it uh, because you have these organizations that are on different platforms. And so it's like taking one computer language and, and, you know, the whole cobalt and all this other stuff. ASCII and exactly <laughs> all those things that I don't know anything about, but that engineers still use today, apparently some of that stuff. And so that that's, it, it isn't a foreign concept, but it is something that has been brought to and specifically in the PEO arena. And it's just a matter of understanding it and the benefits and understanding the detriments and, in, in either doing it or not doing it. So um, like anything else, it uh, it depends on whether it's the right thing for you. So there, I got it in. Yeah, that's, that's a great legal term. Make sure that you memorize that, Stephen, so that you can play a, a lawyer whenever. <laughs> so it depends. Um, so uh, somehow we lost uh, Stephen. He, uh, so he, hopefully he'll come back. Uh, two things so we'll we'll keep this one so anonymous oh there you are hey steven uh yeah no, no problem because we got a question for you oh okay. here's here's a question from an anonymous attendee my erc claim was filed by a firm in raleigh on june 2023 uh is there a way we can find out where we might be in that queue where you are in the queue, no, there's no uh, list that says you're 7,000 out of 14,000. Um, what you can do, and if that firm doesn't have the ability, we can help you out with this at no no charge. Um, there's a form called an 8821. It's a limited power of attorney that grants a third party the right to look at your transcript. And what, what that will do is you can actually use the transcript to confirm whether it was even received or not. And the date that it was received by the IRS is about as close as we can get to your place in line in that we can tell once they start processing again, oh, they're processing the one received in February of 23, the ones in March of 23. And you can kind of pick on that cadence to find out, oh, well, they'll, they'll probably send yours this December or November, or God help you, you know, June of 2029. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, the the transcript works with, uh, accounting firms have a lot of times software that can interface directly with the IRS. That IRS software then cross-references, do they have an 8821 on file? If so, access granted, here's the transcript, here's your answer. So um, talk to them, and, and if they don't have that, uh, Please pass along your information through BGW to us. We'll pull your transcript at no charge and share whatever feedback we can give you. There's a follow on comment uh, said they advised us, Stephen shared the IRS has suspended all ERC processing while they try to get a handle on the fraud. Unclear when they will start again. They won't give you any info. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer. End quote. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, and it's not, but it's kind of funny. The reason we started this thing four plus years ago was because all the gobbledygook coming out of Washington, like it was just hard to like, so everybody, if you remember, 
everybody was out doing a webinar saying the same sanitized talking points. They were exactly the same. You could just go across any channel, unlike MSNBC to uh, Fox. <laughs> In this case, they were all the same. <laughs> so we were like, well, we we just speak English, you know, so and even that's questionable at times. So but we just wanted to speak as clearly and concisely as possible with the best knowledge that we had while we're trying to figure it out like you guys are, too. So we're going to continue to do that. Not next week. Again, Independence Day, celebrate the fact that, yes, Mecklenburg Declaration. And by the way, uh, Jim Marascio, thank you for the kudos. He said it's a great read. So Jim Marascio is extremely well read, even better read than I am. So if he's endorsing that book, Who's Your Founding Father? I got to I got to go meet this guy. Uh, he was a like a ESPN and I think Sports Illustrated writer at, at some point. He's up here in uh, Davidson. So um, anyway, Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I uh, really appreciate it. A uh, lot of wisdom. Appreciate your uh, perspective. Jack, it's always good to have you on. Uh, you know, it's you enjoyed, uh, we've enjoyed you joining the crazy train. I mean, what was it, maybe three weeks into into this thing? And you're like, hey, you might want to have a, an attorney join you. <laughs> I, I think I'm a founding founding father by um at by relationship and yes getting on yes, jumping are. on the boat like the you know for for the third week or fourth week into it when you guys were doing it when we were doing it two days two days a week because there's so two much days information a week. to share yeah you man know? hey well you guys uh hopefully your air conditioners are working well because it's hot here in charlotte north carolina <laughs> hopefully we get some rain uh but for everybody that has tuned in thank you very much Thank you again, Stephen. Jack, Jerry, thank you. Thank you, thank you your team. You. And if I have the pleasure of ever being invited back on again, I'll make sure that I do it with a, a really cool backdrop and not at an odd angle on my phone like uh, technology <laughs> forced me to today. And it actually looks pretty good, man. It, you, you, you adapted and overcame. This is really good. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Thanks. Have you, a Jerry. great Take day. Care, thank you. Happy holidays Bye -bye. next week. You too.